how on earth do you develop a new group set? To be honest with you, I have no idea, but I know a man who does, Shimano's Tim Gerrit, who sat down with me recently for this video podcast to help explain the process, the journey that Shimano goes on to bring a new group set to market. So today, as you probably know, Shimano has launched not one, but two new top level race ready group sets, Enduro DI2 and Ultegra DI2. Now you get all the details on these new group sets and my reaction to the changes in the video link down below and up there. But in this video, it's a deep dive technical conversation around the nuts and bolts of developing a new group set and that process, the journey they go on, which I found really illuminating and very interesting. So hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Now you can listen to this if you prefer as a podcast, at iTunes, Spotify, and all the usual places. I put a link down below, or you sit back and watch the video. Sadly, we didn't actually film the video, but hopefully you still enjoy it nonetheless. Okay, let's dive in and have a listen. Okay, uh, Tim, uh, thanks for joining me today. Before we dive into the development of a group set, can you explain your role at Shimano and how long you've been at Shimano for? Yes, um, so I've been with Shimano for over 24 years now in, in different roles, but uh, at least for the bigger part being uh, responsible for products, technology, and uh, especially in the roadside. And since the last uh, four years responsible for our product uh, uh, management development team. So basically in between our head office in Japan and the European market, both ways for new developments and, and needs for Shimano products. Okay. And so today you're launching not one, but two new group sets. So no exciting day, but before we get into the, you know, the detail of the new group sets, let's cast our mind back to 2016 and you launched uh, 9100 series, which is a, a big step forward and it's still a benchmark group set, some big updates on that group set. So how on earth do you improve on that group set? I mean, where do you start? I mean, what's the kind of, where you're already thinking with that group set, oh, we can do this better? I mean, how, yeah. I guess, uh, what, what's your yeah. starting point for developing a new group set, basically? So the, the process is, is, is two ways. Yeah, there is always like a dot on the horizon. Uh, I mean, there is a, a, some form of predictability if you see the roadmap of, of Shimano. Uh, but that's not the, the only point where we develop on. So what we do is continuously develop new technologies and, uh, and, and put them in kind of a library to use or already have them ready for the next uh, generation. And then by the time... Uh, we hit towards the next timeline for an iteration of a new generation or, or a group set. We see what is available and what is ready and mature to use in order to have it uh, part as additional functionality and value into the new group set. And then it starts rolling. So when you launch the last group set, do you already have some stuff in mind that you could improve on? Or was it a case of trying to find areas you can improve on? Yeah, one. yeah. So, so maybe one of the the, the prime examples in that is uh, R two. Uh, so, so two uh, examples. One is the drivetrain, which you've seen is the the, the new gearing. The uh, the Hyperglide Plus was already uh, in development by the time we were doing the last group set. It finally made its debut in mountain bike, but it was originally set for last generation. Uh, the second one is the the wireless uh, cockpit interface of the protocol that was also already in development for the previous generation, uh, but uh, but made it only to this group uh, because it wasn't ready and perfect enough by the time uh, of release of the last group set. So this is always an ongoing thing. Okay, so you never have like a two years developing your group set. It's always ongoing and you release it when it's ready, when the time's right to... Brand when it's, when it's perfect also to live up to the quality standard and expectation of a brand of Shimano, then we will release it. Okay. And how is important, I know you sponsor a lot of pros and you work with a lot of pro teams. How important is the feedback from the pros and also from consumers? Do you get feedback from consumers? Do you read the forums and comments? Yeah. Do yeah. So um, uh, that that is describing uh, our main role is to pick on feedback and needs and that relate to trends and developments in the cycling markets. They, we sponsor, uh, I think, the majority 
of the, the Pro2 teams, but also within our distributing network, we have entities towards local teams. We get uh, from our uh, technical side quite some feedback and, and needs and from uh, consumer engagement at events and through our digital channels, we will get feedback uh, and, and, and read reviews. But also a big part is as we are a supplier towards many bike manufacturers, they respectively also have their own channels towards teams, towards consumers, towards dealers. So we utilize all these channels and that's describing the role of my team is not to just follow one single channel, but to make sure that we harvest from there what is uh, the general need. So not, not so much what is the expectation, but what is the need in terms of features that are needed to uh, comply with future cycling and then try to find a solution uh, for that, uh, which is future proof. Okay. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of a new group set, it's an sort of overarching sort of goal focus with a new group set. So there's some like primary focus that you're always trying to achieve at the end of the, the journey. Yeah, well, the, the tagline is uh, the, the science of, uh, of, of speed. So it is uh, the, trying to get all the, the marginal gains in the individual aspects of the group set. And that is maybe more on the product side where, we, where you've seen uh, a more efficient drivetrain, a more uh, stable platform. Again, uh, the better comfort, the better control in the brakes. So all those things uh, are more like we're the development focus uh, for us. But uh, strategically, uh, I think uh, you can see related to the fact that we have two group sets and we purely focus it on electronic shifting is that uh, it is really focused towards this is really the two group sets made for pure road on road cycling and give it also that identity and non-compromising uh, position within uh, the, the market. Okay. You mentioned marginal gains. Um how hard is it to improve on a group set each time you bring out a new group set? Is it getting harder and harder or there's still sort of big gains to be made, do you think? It's like a top athlete. I mean, the closer you get to your 100%, the more difficult it gets exponentially. Uh, uh, so I think that's that's a basic rule um, in, in, in terms of performance improvement. Uh, what is especially, I think, where our strength is that we don't look at it at a single point like, hey, I am now the lightest, or I am the most aero, or I'm the most stiffest. For us, it's always how you win races. It's uh, if, if the balance of all these small improvements can make you go faster, this is what wins races. Not the fact that you were excelling on a single point, but not on the overall. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of the new group set then. And um, there's quite a lot to talk about, quite a few key talking points. The first one is, is 12 speed. Um, We've had some well, Shimano in the past, but 10 speed was a big development, 11 speed was a big development. How important is 12 speed? And how far do you think we can go? 13, 14, 15 speed down the line? Is that a possibility? Well, well, if I can go back to what I just said, I think it, it, first of all, the principle of Shimano is always to add something. So to increase the before performance. So if it helps, it's not a number game. It's not trying to get the most gears if, if it helps and if it's in line with the expectation of performance uh, i have no ex i know i cannot say today where it might go uh, whether it goes to 50 speed or or even go down it, it, the point is that it needs to suit a purpose and for now this was uh the main purpose to go to 12 speed was not just a number but the fact that we've seen that racing has developed uh, also in different areas, uh, more extreme climbing, uh, faster sprinting. Uh, and uh, one of the feedbacks we got from teams was with the existing offering of 11 speed, it was impossible without making many changes during a stage race, for example, to have one drivetrain that suits all. So the, the range and compatibility without having to change to many different uh, front gears or uh, different rear derailleurs even with, uh, with, with a longer cage <clears throat> was no longer uh, really practical. So what we set off with is to make a package with three cassettes and three uh, front chain wheel offerings that can do it all. And this is where 12 speed was the solution for us. Okay, so 12 speed wasn't trying to keep up with your competitors, SRAM and Campac. It was trying to solve a problem and that's trying to make the choosing of a group set package easier for the pros so they've got less fewer options but the better the right option more of time i guess yes indeed 
in the past you might the pros might swap cassettes for every stage but now they use the same cassette probably for the entire grand tour yeah so we make mechanics really happy with this <laughs> new group set <laughs> make their lives a lot easier yeah <laughs> um they're spending more time on disc brakes now aren't they so um let's talk about disc brakes because that's the I know last Dura Race was the first time you incorporated disc brakes properly into the Dura Race groups, and now you brought some quite considerable improvements in terms of um, like the more clearance, uh, different lever feel and stuff. All the pros now use disc brakes. Um, you must have had a load of feedback over the last two, three years from the pros about disc brakes, and we've seen the likes of Chris Froome being quite vocal around disc brakes. I mean, can you talk, talk to us about this development of the disc brakes and what you've changed and how you've changed it? Yeah, so as, as you stated correctly, the last gen, uh, generation of Durace, uh, or the current one, was actually the first one that uh, could uh, have the Durace branding because it was, to us, race ready. But it is a journey. I mean, we come from having a mountain bike and, uh, um, let's say, off-road, gravel, disc brakes towards full road compatible disc brakes when we started with the frame platforms such as flat mount, which is now the proprietary standard for all uh, all, all road uh, on road disc brakes, we learned from that from the pro teams. But it's a journey not just by Shimano, but we made together with uh, the frame uh, makers because uh, finally it's the total package that makes your performance uh, uh, better. And uh, early on, we already noticed that the basic performance of the Shimano disc brake was. Uh, was, was well accepted and the first step was to have the same kind of performance as a rim brake. Also to, to balance out the, the differences in a peloton between the, the, the rim and disc brake riders and, uh, and also to make the transition more easy. And um, that is why our current disc brake was the, for a long time the benchmark now that most of the riders the majority have swapped to disc brakes it's the time to increase uh, and change the performance slightly towards more disc brake specific benefits and this is where you see this natural um, evolution of, of disc brakes with it frames have changed so uh, things like the stability uh, and flex that could lead often to like disc brake touching and 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 misalignments issues have been solved and uh, so the platforms have become much more stable so working with that as well uh, allowed us to make also a more stiffer and more stronger and stable brake and you can see that all these elements start to add up together to the next level of performance okay and you've improved the clearance between the pads and the um and the caliper how have you achieved that and and how does that impact the lead the lead feel when you're when you're braking so um, this is uh, normally if you uh, uh, yeah, have just a, the regular um, uh, understanding of, uh, of, 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 of uh, physics, it is means if you want to increase the clearance, you either uh, increase the stroke uh, of the input or reduce the power. Um, but what we did is we used a similar technology uh, as we use in, uh, in mountain biking, but also in gravel by having a, uh, uh, and the, uh, the servo wave mechanism where the pivot point changes, we can, during the stroke, uh, increase and decrease the momentum and the travel of the, the, the piston, the main piston. And that uh, allows a much more solid and stronger feel uh, from the input side, but still have a 10% more clearance on the pad side without reducing power. And that relates to, uh, that feel is very different very different, slightly different. So somebody who's used to a disc brake will now really uh, uh, be happy with that feeling, but somebody just coming off of a rim brake might think that that step is too big. So this kind of explains why we made those step in between uh, in this transition phase. Okay, okay. And you're still offering rim brakes with a new uh, group set, and I guess the rim brakes haven't changed much compared to the last version. Do you see much future for rim brakes in the pro pedal or in the consumer market and disc brake sales must be uh, you know, far and away exceeding that of rim brakes? Well, um, when we started with disc brake, uh, uh, we have uh, promised and committed that as long as there is a need for rim brakes, we will make them. But uh, uh, especially for pro riders, because we won't push one away or the other and let the market decide. But the fact uh, at this moment is that uh, for real road racing, I think already a change to 
to almost 100% uh, disc brake for all new uh, bikes and platforms. Yes, there is still a market, but it's starting to move towards like hand-built bikes and uh, and specific bike, not the real com- competition style road bikes. Uh, so uh, this is also the reason uh, why indeed this generation does have rim brakes, but that is the product of so many years of development that uh, it was even harder to, uh, even if we would have spent a lot of R&D time, it would have been harder to make our rim brakes, which are the ben- benchmark, even better. So in that sense, uh, it is uh, a, a just a minor change to make them compatible to uh, to our new uh, group in terms of appearance and uh, using that that proven, long-term proven performance uh, of our rim brakes. So you think rim brakes are as good as they'll ever get, really? They, they can't get any better than they are? No. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they can. I mean, I've, 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 I've been in twenty years of development, seeing it from, from where it started to where it's now, and uh, so far I've not seen any break, any rim break, which was better, uh, unless it's it will kill and damage the rim itself by, uh, <laughs> and I'm not, I don't think you want to have that. So no. uh, having the best balance on the bike, I think we are nearly to the final stage of, uh, of the performance of rim break. Okay, with uh, disc brakes, two of the common complaints I see from my viewers in the comments is um, they're heavy compared to rim brakes and they're not as aero as rim brakes. I mean, is that are they two aspects you try to tackle or can you tackle with disc brakes in a group set? Well, the, 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 the aero aspect has mostly more to do uh, with how it's built into the frame. And you see that with our partners, so the frame makers, that there is a lot of development going on to... Uh, to make that uh, more aero. And in, in that sense, if you look at the complete bike, um, at this moment, what I hear at least from, from the bike makers, they're at, uh, on par with, uh, with, with what was out there on, uh, on, uh, on rim brakes. Uh, because of integration, uh, disc brake, yes, the caliper itself might look uh, rather bulky at that place, but, uh, but if you see what you can do with the frame and the fork and the integrated cables, much more easy than you could ever do with a rim brake with mechanical cables and also sitting there in the front. Then uh, what I hear is that uh, from 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 our uh, partners that that they're on aero side already on par with that. So uh, on the weight side, um, yeah, there might be a, a slight difference still, but also depending on what wheels you are using. But but seeing again the 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 performance benefit uh, in that sense. Uh, of having a controllable bike, uh, I'm I'm not sure if we if 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 just having the lightest bike makes you go faster. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think a lot of I've I've seen a lot of comments in the last kind of year, which I think bike weights are going up a little bit in some way, and some people seem to be obsessed about weight. And I guess no, as I know, weight isn't everything. And when you ride a bike, there's a lot more to a bike than weight. But I think lots of people seem to be obsessed with weight, and the disc brakes seem to be the focus of that annoyance i guess that their weight's going up in some regards so um let's talk about um i mean the other exciting aspect of the group set has gone sort of wireless um but not full wireless were you you must have been tempted to go down the full wireless route as sram had proven it's possible well as i explained in in the intro uh, we were already uh, uh developing this for the previous generation and our design uh, and and our philosophy basically is that we we won't add any features just for features. It must make the product better. And uh, so wireless by itself, it's a nice marketing feature, but it can never be the goal. The goal is to make the bike better. And uh, in that sense, if you look at the technology we use, so electronic shifting, I think we we proven is the benchmark. And the way you make the, the, the command, so the, the input, yes, it can be a cable, it can be... Uh, a combination of a cable and a wireless signal or, or full wireless signal, but you have to see where the benefit is. Yeah, so um, it's it's quite a technical uh, story, but again, if you see the, 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 the slides in the presentation, what, what we try to show is that uh, in, if you want to have the interaction, such as trim, or uh, if you're cross-chaining, such as uh, single shifting, you need uh, the uh, interaction in the drivetrain to work as a whole and not two individual components trying to shift something independently. So uh, I think that's the big benefit by having the heart 
as a rear derailleur, being able to control also the front derailleur. Uh, and, and, and besides things like single shifting, but also having information from the whole drivetrain towards outside, such as a, a, a data recording device. Um, but in case of a low battery, it can monitor the entire system and it can prioritize which uh, shift is uh, more important for you to, to, to keep going instead of you stepping off the bike and swapping a battery from one to the other uh, uh, Mac. So things like that can only be done when you make it one integrated system. So these benefits prevail over uh, uh, a gimmick or uh, just uh, a singular technology okay i'm intrigued by the fact you've made the shifting speed faster i don't remember using current duration it's a bit slow so is that something you tried to achieve was that feedback from pros or that's just a a happy byproduct of the move to semi-wireless um well the uh overall it should always uh, again uh be better and these are the the marginal gains and uh as by itself a wireless uh, protocol from a signal from A to B could be slightly slower than a cable. Uh, it was also uh, our uh, goal to overcome that to make sure that whatever we bring in wireless as a total package should be faster than the existing wires to 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 prevent that discussion from even happening. And I think our engineers over exceeded uh, the goal in that sense. <laughs> uh, if you look at the charge, how fast they were able to make it. Okay, and and the shift speed does that come solely from the no, new wireless protocols, that also the um, the chain and the sprocket interface? Mainly also the, the, the motors uh, which okay. are inside and the gearing which are inside the, the, the derailleurs. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's too bad that, that you weren't able to join the ride because, uh, like you said, I wasn't unhappy with already the, the, the shifting speed that we have in current plat- uh, platform, but blown away by the fact, especially from the front shifting, uh, how much smaller that 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 part is and how much more power and speed comes out of it in in in, in fast and controllable front shifting okay and just to be clear there is no longer a mechanical version of this new group so it's di2 only yeah yeah and same as uh, it's part of our focus uh, that uh, we see that for real on-road riding uh, if you see what what is out there in the market it is all electronical shifting from us and our competitors by now so uh, i'm very happy that also our competitors followed us in in electronical shifting and now is the benchmark for real on-road riding so also to position uh, uh dura is as a real on-road group but also ultegra uh, uh, this was the choice to say okay let's make them both uh, uh, fully electronical uh, in order to uh, to position and, and take the lead in that segment. There's quite a, a moment in history for dual race because you know, it's always been a mechanical version before DIT, obviously, and you kept the mechanical version for the last generation, but now it's gone. There's, there's no demand for it and you're killing it off. I mean, that's a, quite a key moment, isn't it, really? Yeah, but we've also seen that, that, that it's not just for us, but it's also, you see uh, cycling, road cycling diversify. So we've seen gravel, gravel racing, uh, but also a whole new mid-segment of, of hand-built bikes coming in there that are not the old style one view, uh, one way view of a road bike uh, to, to do everything. So there will be different needs and, and, and different segments covered by different group sets uh, for Shimano. So but uh, it allowed us actually to say, okay, then if we want to focus duration or take on the pure road cyclist, this is the moment where we are confident to do so. Given that DIT is a future for the top level group sets, Dura Race and Ultegra, can we see it trickling down to lower level group sets in the future? I mean, I know there's been a lot of demand for 105 DIT for a long, long time. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's coming then. It's coming soon. No, uh, I mean, I mean, I, uh, I can't say uh, if if it's coming because it, unless it we can make it at the right price point, at the right with the right feature set, uh, that's the philosophy. We do, we don't do it. So it's not. Uh, so like I said, it's my personal dream, and I'm pretty sure that seeing uh, the direction that if that is possible, that that would be uh, a way forward. But at this moment, uh, there's no concrete uh, plan there to to be able to make that. Okay, watch your space then. Yeah. So, um, so you launched two new group sets, which is unusual. Normally, it's dual racing and old Tokyo. And I guess 
COVID-19 was a big, I mean, how big an impact was the pandemic last year in developing a group set? And I mean, how much did that upset your plans? Um, for development, not so much because it was already part of this plan. So um, if you see the normal a timeline of changing group set. It looks like this one was a little bit longer, but let's not forget that previous group set was also quite late to the market. Uh, so it's it's so it was already planned uh, even before the pandemic started. Uh, the only thing that uh, gave us a little bit of setback in the development was the fact that there was no full scale racing in order to validate uh, our products available last year, uh, which could have helped us. But we made up for that by doing that this year. Okay. When you've developed um, a group set, say Dual Race Di2, it's, it's done, finished, signed off, and then you go to Ultegra. Is it simply a case of copy and paste the chain materials? And then, or is there more of a fundamental change? That need- um, no, it's, it, it is part of the same development because, fi- because finally a lot of the technologies need to be compatible in order to do mass production of those parts as well in our factories by the higher standards. So it's not a one-off and then we copy paste and go to the next. It is part of a kind of a semi-modular uh, design philosophy, which fits our, uh, our our factories as well, because making one or developing one is one aspect, but being able to produce many, many, many by the same quality standards to the market is uh, is the next thing which you need to take in when you develop the products and, and not as an afterthought. Okay, so you're considering the manufacturing aspect while you're developing a group set and yes. how you can make it and not just doing it afterwards, I see. Okay. Um, it always strikes me that unless you're a weight weenie, Ultegra is uh, the best buy because it's essentially dual race, but a lower price point and a bit of weight penalty. Can, do you not see there being an opportunity to make dual race kind of a head and shoulders better than Ultegra? I mean, they are so close together, aren't they? In many uh, aspects. I think from a marketing perspective, that would be nice. But on the other side, if everybody can enjoy an Ultegra group set, and it allows more people to cycle at a higher level. That doesn't that help that help us all? Well, yeah, I can't argue with that at all. It just seems like if you, you know you, what unless you're paying for the you know, the weight or the prestige of dual races, Ultegra is just the the sensible choice, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, even within our team, like I just explained, I I, I pass my responsibilities to to one of the members in my team. That means that I'm no longer entitled of testing the dual race, but going towards <laughs> Ultegra, which I'm absolutely happy with to uh, to ride so you've been at shimano for a long time and you've seen group sets develop a lot what have been the biggest developments that you've been proud to be involved with and that you've seen really kind of made an improvement to cycling generally uh, well uh, i think one of the things uh, that uh, and and unfortunately then we missed each other during the the gravel introduction but uh, that was i think one of the the major highlights for me the, the last couple of years is that we were able to lead the market by a gravel specific group. And I was part of that by from the early idea to uh, I've been over to the US and, and several places also in Europe when it picked up to to see the market, to really grassroots style, being able to, uh, to, to, to see what the needs are, where it's going, and then to make a dedicated group set for that. And uh, to me, that was uh, a, a really nice experience, but also showing that uh, that that we're in touch with the market and, and making something actually which is uh, in line with market trends and developments. Uh, and, and, and that's often very abstract when you see, look at a big company in the Far East making many products, but being so much involved in cycling really was, a, yeah, to me, was a really good experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm glad you brought up gravel because gravel is clearly a really big sector at the moment. And the, the lines between sort of road bikes and gravel bikes are blurring and we're seeing the same groups that have been used on both bikes and interchange. Do you see pro road race developed groups like Dura Race and GRX being distinctly different in the future? Or can you see them sort of crossing over and merging and Dura Race being used on gravel bikes and GRX on road bikes? Oh, uh, it, it, I mean, it, it is already happening that it crosses over, but we will try to 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 build unique features uh, for each uh, segment. And that doesn't mean that we, we, we think it must be A or B, but if if the set of features that works for you, as, a, as you said, uh, gravel cycling is also a big segment. It can reach anywhere from uh, world explorer trekking bikes to... Uh, 
previously, uh, randonneurs, uh, hardtail 29er mountain bikes, uh, German style trekking bikes towards uh, endurance road bikes and cyclocross bikes. So there's a it's, it's a very diverse category. And if, if the set of things that you need for your type of gravel riding is closer to a road bike, then there should be that link. If your needs are closer towards uh, what is previously used by a, a hardtail uh, 29er, then this is this is what we will offer. And we will try to capture, and if it's closer towards a World Explorer trekking bike with a drop bar, then that is what we will try to offer. And there will be crossover with mountain bike parts, there will be crossover with trekking parts, and there will be crossover. But trying to have that unique set of features in the middle uh, and, and being compatible all three ways is, is, is basically the direction there. Okay, because I know it's a new race has an eleven thirty four cassette, which is interesting in itself. Because in olden days, eleven twenty five might be in the biggest, and then eleven twenty eight. So eleven thirty four, that's almost a gravel setup with a one bar in the front. Perhaps that could be a a gravel group set. So you, it seems like you could almost. But but again, again there you can come into a, a long discussion because if you come from the road cycling and the endurance cycling, there you see that. Uh, uh, there is still the the large majority globally is still on a double setting as where if you go towards the more uh, mountain bike replacement uh, and, 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 and and trekking bike replacement there you see a, a predominantly uh, a drive towards a, a single one so so also there uh, we can make the right products matching the right type of riding so so one by was never going to be a factor for dual race because you don't have a demand from the pros uh, for one buy uh, no because finally it's a non-compromiser so if we would add that in order then uh, uh, a one buy would definitely need a clutch and a clutch uh, uh, increases the the friction so it redu- uh, reduces the real performance in terms of uh, of energy consumption of, of of the group set if you need that for a more technical style of riding you're not an on-road rider so unless you can make that improve your performance overall but not just because the fact the singular fact that we want to, the goal is to have a one by or the goal is to be most aerodynamic or most light so that, that's part of the non-compromise and i hope ben will send you a couple of those t-shirts i'm wearing as well with the non-compromise <laughs> i think that's the the main tagline of of, of what dura should stand for no compromises i like it um i guess if you restart working on the next generation dura race is that already um out there you sort of imagine what any new groups that be or is that a few years off yet i said a lot of the technologies are ongoing uh developments so it's not yet we are developing the group set as a project yet but there is technologies already being on the development that uh, might not or might make it towards the next uh, iteration of uh, of of the the road platforms Okay. If you had a crystal ball, what would you like to see personally from a, a group set in the future? I mean, if you like, no limits, what would you like to see? Oof. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a difficult one because it's uh, I'm too much engaged already in into all the developments, so, so maybe not the it. right one for me uh, to uh, to answer. For me, I've always wondered when we go to like internal hub gears and or in a frame, like a really small sort of compact system and no uh, derailers hang off a frame, but that doesn't seem to be a, you know, a realistic. In general, integration, I think, is, is, is a general market trend that we see yeah. and uh, maybe not dr- driven completely from the pure road cycling, but what you see happening on, on e-bike side, also on e-road and e-mountain bike and sportive bikes how uh, fast now frame makers and bike makers are uh, moving towards integration, I think you can expect that that will be driving any future generation of, uh, of components and bikes.